grace where? Grace abounds. Grace abounds. Indeed, it does for us. I just want to make sure that everyone in the parking lot can hear me. If you can hear me, would you please honk your horn? Uh-oh. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Just making sure. Um, it's good to see you all again. Uh, we are at the fifth Sunday in Lent, if you can believe that Lent is uh, almost over. Next Sunday, we celebrate Palm Sunday, uh, and that kicks off our Holy Week celebrations. Uh, we sent out a letter not too long ago detailing our Holy Week celebrations times and, and details about those services. Uh, next Sunday will be normal, um, but then we've got Monday, Thursday, Holy Thursday at 7 o'clock. Good Friday, at fr uh, on Friday, of course, uh, at 7 o'clock. And then Easter Sunday, we have two worship opportunities. We have a 9 o'clock, which will be outside. Hopefully the weather is nice. Um, out on the back lawn, like we had done um, in the fall and uh, the late summer. Um, we'll be in the back there for the 9 o'clock. And then 10.15, we'll be inside. Uh, so if you'd like to be part of any of those, contact the office. Uh, Thursdays, 9 to noon, let us know which service you're going to be at. Each service has, except for the outdoor service, each service has the online option and uh, the drive-in option as well. Today is the last Sunday to order the plants, uh, lilies or azaleas for Easter Sunday. Um, this year, we're not going to do a bulletin, uh, so it's just the plants this year. So if you'd like to order one of those, it's $18 per plant. Again, either azalea or lily. Um, you can pick those up after the 1015 service, or uh, if by chance you're not here, or we can arrange something later to, to pick up. So um, that's all the, the main stuff for uh, the next couple weeks. If you have any questions, of course, please contact me, and I'll be happy to answer those. Today, we are going to sing a hymn today. Okay. okay. <clears throat> And uh, just for Will, we are doing all seven <laughs> verses of the hymn. All right? <laughs> I'll, exp <laughs> I'll explain it as we get to the hymn, but uh, Yuri will play through it once. Um, one whole stanza, and then we'll, we'll join in with stanza one, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, that is our worship today. Today, uh, we get to hear uh, the backwards workings of God. Um, as Jesus talks about uh, how things work different with him than it does in the world. The world seeks upward mobility. Jesus seeks downward mobility. Even Jesus, God himself, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for gathering us here to receive your good gifts. We ask that you fill us with grace and peace. Fill us with your spirit today and lead us in all truth as we seek to follow Jesus. We pray this in his name. Amen. 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 Please stand. declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, I will put my laws within them, and I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. Bearing our sins and in need of a Savior, let us go to our Heavenly Father asking for forgiveness. We take a few moments of silent reflection for personal examination as we place our lives into the light of God's word. Merciful Heavenly Father, you promised a covenant written on your people's hearts. We do not always rely on your promises and great love. We are sorry. Gracious Holy Spirit, through your use of word and sacrament, many people know the Lord. servant of all. 
in the new covenant. I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. In the sacrifice of himself, Jesus, being perfect, became the source of eternal salvation. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For peace in our hearts, knowing that salvation is sure, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For peace among the nations and the growth of the church in faith and numbers, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the church here and wherever God's people gather for praise and worship, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th chapter. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, 
Teacher, we want, to, want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. And Jesus said to them, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those who have been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to him, said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. And again, for our hymn of the day, my song is Love Unknown. Um, Yuri plays through uh, one whole stanza, and then we join in with stanza one.
dear friends in Christ. And taking the twelve again, Jesus began to tell them what was to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. Our gospel text for today is now the third time third time in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus told his disciples what would happen to him. Uh, but they still don't get it. Uh, they don't comprehend that the promised Savior, the Messiah, had not come to be served, but to serve. Um, the fact that they completely missed the point is evident when you look at what happened after each time that Jesus told them what was going to happen to him. After the first time Jesus told them, that's when Peter took him aside and said, Lord, this will never happen to you, far be it from you. After the second time that Jesus told them, the disciples began arguing among themselves about who was the greatest. <laughs> and here in our text, right after the third time Jesus told them, James and John go up to him and request these two positions of honor. The, uh, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, <laughs> didn't quite get it. But in all honesty, can we blame them? They left everything when Jesus called them. They decided to uh, scale back from their fishing business. Get scale. <laughs> For the opportunity to follow Jesus. You gotta throw in fish puns when it comes to... Anyway, they had a business, they had a steady income, uh, but now they're in tight with the Messiah, and he's going to be a big deal, right? This guy's going straight to the top, he's going to be bigger than Caesar. And like an early investor, someone who believed in him from the beginning, James and John think they're in a position to apply for the best seats at the table. You know, might as well take this thing all the way to the top. Jesus, we want you to grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left hand, in your glory. Now, the other disciples are upset when, uh, when they find out, you know, and we, we know that they argued among themselves who was the greatest. So I have to assume that they're upset, not because they think that James and John are out of line, but because they didn't think to ask Jesus this first. We might be quick to distance ourselves from the request of James and John, but we certainly understand, don't we? We understand why they asked. We understand the desire to get ahead, to make a name for ourselves. And it's in that respect that our world hasn't changed very much in 2,000 years. Society still champions advancement. It's why we see People taking advantage of others to climb the corporate ladder. It's why we see husbands and wives, parents and children separated because of their jobs. They've either found the dream job or it's necessary to advance their career. It's why we're envious and interested in the rich and the successful, the popular and the attractive, the prideful and the powerful. It's why, as we've seen in our Jude Bible study, that many are enticed and led away and led astray with promises of health and wealth. We understand. We understand their request. Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus responds, you don't know what you are asking. James and John are thinking in the way that the world thinks. They, they want to advance their careers. Grabbing some comfy second-in-command seats next to God's appointed king. But they don't understand what kind of king Jesus is. Even though he's told them, <laughs> they don't understand yet what he has come to do. And how he has come to accomplish what he has come to do. Uh, Jesus' glory is very different from their idea of glory. To sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, Jesus said, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. 
It isn't until after Jesus' death and resurrection that John realized what he had asked of Jesus. He wrote at the very beginning of his gospel, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. On Palm Sunday, which we will celebrate next Sunday, John wrote that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, he said, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. On Monday, Thursday, which we'll celebrate two Thursdays from now, John wrote that Jesus said to his disciples in the upper room, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And right before Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus, John wrote that Jesus said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. See, for Jesus, glory doesn't look like moving up in the world. It looks like hitting rock bottom. When he speaks about his glory, Jesus is speaking about his bitter suffering and death. A crown of thorns is pressed into his head. Nails pierce his hands and feet. He had gaping wounds on his back from the scourging. He twisted and turned in pain as he suffocated under the weight of his own body. The cross is Jesus' glory. And next to him are two others, one crucified at his right and one crucified at his left. Those places of honor were not given to James and John, but to two unnamed thieves. You do not know what you are asking, Jesus said. You see, friends, how the ways of the world are turned upside down by God. The Son of Man, God himself, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. He, he didn't seek that upward mobility that the world champions. He didn't come to ascend to power to kick Caesar off his throne and take his place as king. He didn't raise up a powerful army of soldiers to rule the nations. He instead was whipped and beaten and nailed to a tree. He didn't rise to the top. He descended to the very bottom, to the depths of hell itself, and he went there for you. He selflessly emptied himself to save all who have sinned, all who have suffered, all who have been separated from the love of God. The cross looks like foolishness to the world, everything that the world despises and avoids, but there. On the cross is the love and power of God in action and on display. This mysterious, backwards working of God is our salvation. And it changes how we view the world, how we live, and, and what we value. God calls us to this strange downward mobility. I mean, think of the apostles. John, James, and the others, they did not rise to power and the glory of Rome or in health and wealth. They all suffered terribly, and most of them were killed for the gospel, as so many throughout the ages have. John even mentions that Peter would die a specific kind of death in order to, quote, glorify God. Jesus told the twelve, you know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. We are all called to this downward mobility. It shall not be so among you us either, to follow Jesus into selfless servanthood, called to pick up our crosses and die. Our death may not look like the death of the disciples. It might not be sudden. It might not be dramatic. It might be slower and more subtle as we die each day a little more to dreams of upward mobility. And yet it's there in the suffering, in the lowly humble, worthless, foolish things of this world 
that God does his best work. Think about how he gives us the greatest gift, the gift of forgiveness. He, he gives it to us through ordinary water, through some unleavened bread and some wine, through the proclamations of a sinful preacher. And look how he cares for his creation and for the weak, the little, the lost, and the last. It's, it's in the changing of a diaper. It's in the comforting of the sick and the widowed. It's in the giving of time and money to help the less fortunate. It's in the freedom to put aside dreams of advancement to care for family. We live there in faith and freedom in the wonder of God's work done below. Don't despise those things like the world does. We rejoice in suffering and we delight in service. The world seeks to ascend, but we follow Jesus and we follow him down. To put it this way, we live in the death of Jesus. That's where he meets us. And it's the safest and best place to be because that's where he will raise us. In uniting us to his death, to sin, through our baptism, we know that just as he was raised from the dead, we will be resurrected with him on the last day. Thanks be to God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. With one heart, with one voice, we confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born in the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray for ourselves, the church around the world, and all people in their various circumstances. For the church here, and wherever people gather around word and sacrament, that God would move us to true repentance, so that we reflect in our lives the love that He has written on our hearts. Let us pray to the Lord. For the clergy and lay leaders of the church, that God would help them call the repentant back, enable healing across painful divisions, and teach catechumens of all ages the message of salvation. Let us pray to the Lord. That our Lord would bring about understanding across political borders, between racial, generational, economic, and cultural differences, and within families of all sizes and shapes, let us pray to the Lord. For teachers and students, social workers and counselors, police and all first responders, that God would keep them safe and healthy, guiding them in crises and sustaining them in chronic problems. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who are in exile from home, those who have been incarcerated, and any who have not been treated with human dignity, that God would surround them with supportive individuals and organizations. Let us pray to the Lord. For those near and dear to us, people everywhere who seek healing and peace, and those known only to God, that our Lord would heal restore and console them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord Jesus, come on to everything. These and any other things you would have us ask of you, Heavenly Father, grant to us for the sake of the bitter sufferings and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And ask you now to take out the communion cups and prepare to celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Through this ordinary means of bread and wine, Jesus comes to us, promises to be here. His body, his blood, given and shed for the forgiveness of our sins. So I ask you to hold them out. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. 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 We open the bread. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. drink the blood of Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. And now may this true body and this true blood strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith, now and for life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to Almighty God that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in firm and love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. As we receive the blessing of our Lord, we place our hands out in front of us like a cup to remind us that everything we have is a gift from God. We come with nothing to give, nothing to offer, and everything to receive. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. God's blessings on your week. Yeah, God's blessings as we are getting close to starting Holy Week. Amen.